Uh, thank you very much indeed, and um, I, I bid you a very warm welcome to the Assembly. You come at a very interesting day. Uh, it's germane to, to your uh, discussions uh, this afternoon. Uh, and um, I, I, I want to welcome you on behalf of the Justice Committee. The just, uh, it's very fashionable now to be very critical of the Assembly, saying, you know, it's, it's uh, uh, not performing terribly well, it's not doing this, not doing that, and so forth. But one of the uh, success stories in the Assembly is, in fact, the way the committee system works. And I think the committee si system works extremely well. Uh, and I think uh, um, uh, one of the uh, best examples of that is, in fact, uh, the Justice Committee, uh, which, uh, despite the facts made up of different parties and so forth, uh, operates in a, a fairly non-partisan manner. Uh, and I think we are very fortunate to have had a, a good series of, of chairpersons and, indeed, uh, vice chair. Um, we uh, originally had Lord Morrow, then we had Paul Given, uh, and now we have Alistair Ross, all of them from the DUP, uh, and uh, Raymond McCartney as, as vice chair. Uh, all of them have served the committee tremendously well, and all of them have shown a particular interest in expanding the agenda, expanding the horizons, as it were, of the committee. Uh, and indeed, uh, I myself and a couple of other colleagues just back from New York, where we visited uh, Brooklyn, a uh, number of, of courts there, uh, seeing how, in fact, uh, innovative methods of tackling uh, uh, criminal justice uh, could, could, in fact, take place. Uh, and it was very interesting uh, and uh, very important for us to open up uh, to problem-solving techniques in terms of uh, criminal justice. Now, I know that you're not here to discuss that, I understand that, but I, I just want to get the point across to you. When people do criticise the Assembly and rightly criticise the Assembly, the Assembly does some very good work, and I believe in particular the committees do that. Uh, and uh, I, want to in, uh, I want to welcome you here. This is your Assembly. Uh, this is... Uh, uh, a place where issues such as the vital issues you're going to talk about today, issues relating to Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland uh, and, and the discussion on abortion. Very important, very topical issues and issues which I hope uh, you, you will consider deeply today. Uh, you're very, very fortunate uh, uh, today uh, to, to have um, uh, speakers that will be informative, uh, that... Uh, are well experienced in their areas and who will stimulate debate for you. And uh, that's something that we should always encourage, debate, discussion, uh, because that's what this forum is for and that's what your uh, uh, academic uh, uh, disciplines are for. And I think that's terribly important. Uh, the seminar will focus on Bill of Rights. Uh, in relation to the first theme, uh, uh, we're all aware that the Belfast Agreement established that a Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland should reflect the particular circumstances of Northern Ireland and should reflect the principles of mutual respect for the identity and ethos of both communities and parity of esteem. Since then, there have been some developments to enable the implementation of Bill of Rights provisions contained in the Good Friday Agreement. Amongst them is the report published by the Bill of Rights Forum uh, in March 2008, and I have to say I was a member of that forum. <laughs> um, and uh, I think the forum did uh, a tremendous amount of good work, um, uh, much of the work, uh, I, I fear, unappreciated. Um, and then the advice to the government was uh, issued by the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission in December of 2008. Uh, and we, we have here, of course, uh, the former Chief Commissioner, uh, of the Human Rights Commission, uh, who, who uh, worked uh, very hard uh, uh, to, to, to bring about uh, that particular advice uh, to the uh, Westminster Go Government, and I refer, of course, to Professor Monica McWilliams. Um, uh, and, and this was followed by a government response in November 2009, uh, which outlined additional considerations followed uh, by a public consultation. 
uh, and it says in the script in front of me, however, since that time, there's been no further apparent movement on the issue. In other words, it was buried. <laughs> uh, but uh, we can unbury it, uh, and we can unbury it in, in our discussion here today. And uh, uh, Dr. Anne Smith, who's uh, sitting at the top here, uh, raring to go in relation to this issue, uh, uh, from, from, the, from Ulster University, right? Um, our, uh, and uh, she, she will talk about the issue of the Bill of Rights, highlighting the research on the issue and raising key considerations to inform the debate and discussion about it. Uh, and I, I, I will listen carefully. I don't have very much time, but I will listen to as much as I can uh, and hopefully uh, bring back considerations that might inform the Justice Committee in relation to this. Now, the second theme we come to uh, later on this afternoon concerns the termination of pregnancy. It's also an area of interest to the Justice Committee and the current Department of Health. Um, uh, uh, guidance states that termination is lawful only where the continuation of pregnancy threatens the life of the woman or would adversely affect her physical or mental health. When, uh, but when applying prevailing guidance and law in this area, there's apparent confusion over the exact circumstances in which a termination may lawfully occur in Northern Ireland. In, in November of 15, Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission successfully brought a judicial review challenging the law in this area in Northern Ireland, and the High Court found that it was contrary to uh, Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights, uh, uh, where there is a failure to provide exceptions to the law prohibiting abortion in respect to two scenarios. First, fatal fetal abnormalities at any time. The second, pregnancies due to sexual crime up to the date when the fetus becomes capable of an existence independent of the mother. And in late uh, January 2016, both the Minister for the Department of Health and the Attorney General independently lodged appeals against uh, that uh, High Court judgment, uh, and we await the outcome of that appeal, or, or appeals, uh, appeals likely to take place probably sometime before the summer, uh, and I, I think that will not be the end of the story. I think it will then go to the Supreme Court in London, uh, and then there will be a, a further decision there. And of course, uh, you come at a very uh, interesting time because on the uh, floor of the assembly this afternoon we'll be debating um, uh, that, the, the, uh, the, that, that particular issue. I might want to adjourn this uh, seminar and just go to the public gallery and listen to it, I just don't know. But uh, certainly uh, it's, it's, uh, uh, the timing of, of this seminar could not have been better planned. <laughs> so. Um, Anyway, we will have uh, Dr. Fiona Bloomer of the Univer uh, of Ulster University and, and Dr. Leslie Hogart of the Open University uh, here today to examine the development and the implementation of abortion policy in Northern Ireland and highlighting their research on the issue and raising key considerations to inform present and future deliberations on it uh, within the Assembly and elsewhere. So uh, uh, these presentations are uh, timely very pertinent to the concerns of the Assembly in general uh, and also the Committee uh, for Justice in particular. I, I want to take this opportunity to thank CAS, its Knowledge Exchange Seminar Series, for organising this event and welcome uh, your speakers this afternoon. And we look forward to what you have to say and to the discussion that will uh, follow. Thank you very much, Lee. Good afternoon and thanks very much, Alban. Um, I certainly do hope that um, my presentation will stimulate debate because it's the debate that is central um, to progressing this particular issue that I will be speaking about. Um, Monica McWilliams, who's sitting there, but he will be joining me for the discussion. She can't get off that lightly. <laughs> um, Myself and Priya Mjornail published a report um, entitled Ensuring a Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland Remains on the Political Agenda. And we sought funding for the report and from Joseph Roundry, which, was, which we successfully got. And we thought about the report and our main focus for the report was to primarily de talk with the political parties to see what their position is on the Bill of Rights. Because 
during the report, we looked at the political party's position over the number of years. And one of the findings that I will speak about later on in the presentation is that for some of the parties who, used, who supported a Northern Ireland Bill of Rights, they seem to have taken a step backwards. Um, and I'll speak more about that later on in the presentation. But the, um, the main aim of the report was to, or is, sorry, is to address the political stalemate that exists um, on this particular issue. As Alban referred to, that the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission submitted their advice in December 2008. The NIO responded in November 2009. And apart from a few developments, nothing really substantial has happened in relation to a Northern Ireland Bill of Rights. So the aim of our report was to, how do we address that political vacuum that has existed? In terms of how we addressed that particular vacuum, we first of all, as I mentioned earlier in my introduction, was that we looked at the political party's position over the number of years on this particular issue. Um, we also provided um, a detailed analysis of the various agreements and declaration on this particular issue and the government's positions, both the British and Irish government's position on this particular issue. Um, and that synopsis is very useful because it brings us to the current um, format where we are today on this particular issue, which is basically a political stalemate. In terms of the methodology of the report, we looked at a range of literature, academic literature, uh, but most importantly, um, manifestos um, from the political parties over the years, um, the agreements, the declarations um, that have been agreed over the years. Um, we also interviewed a number of politicians, um, in, including Alban. Um, we in, um, interviewed representatives from the Irish government. Um, the British government responded to our request for an interview um, through letter. So we got uh, correspondence through a letter with the British government um, outlining their position which is basically that um, without political consensus amongst the political parties, they feel that they can't do any more. Um, it's up to the political parties to take leadership on this issue. And we will touch upon that later on. Um, interviewed uh, some civil society organisations and the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission. With the permission of the interviewees, we asked if it was okay to record the interviews. Um, I think all of them agreed that it was, well, there were one or two um, preferred not to, which was fine. And then when we did um, publish the report, before we published the report, we, um, we asked the interviewees would it be okay to quote this particular quote in this context. Um, and they were happy to do so. So that's just some background to the report and as to how we went about um, writing the report. I mentioned earlier about the um, part of the report. We looked at the party's position over the last, over the number of years on this particular issue. And it's... It presented interesting findings because over the last number of years, the general consensus was that there was general all-party support for a Northern Ireland Bill of Rights, most notably from the two main unionist parties, the UUP and the DUP. Indeed, Ian Paisley Jr. described a Northern Ireland Bill of Rights as necessary for creating a culture of human rights and pinpointed the blame 
for um, pinpointed the blame to the British government for not progressing this particular issue. That was in 1997 in the context of the Northern Ireland Forum for Political Dialogue. Their position, again, interestingly, was supported by the UUP at that stage under the leadership of Dermot Nesbitt, who said that they supported um, the DUP's um, position, which recognises all party support for a Bill of Rights. Unfortunately, whenever we did the interviews um, for the project, there has been a regression on those parties in terms of a Northern Ireland Bill of Rights. A representative from the UUP felt that Northern Ireland doesn't need a Pacific Bill of Rights, but if there was to be a Bill of Rights, he would be happy with a UK Bill of Rights. So in that particular context, a UK Bill of Rights, not a Northern Ireland Bill of Rights. The DUP's position is that they are fearful of the disparity that it may cause of human rights across the United Kingdom if Northern Ireland has a Pacific Bill of Rights. So you can see the regression over the years on behalf of those two parties. There is a modicum of hope. Those parties who aren't in favour of a Northern Ireland Bill of Rights, they did say that they are open to persuasion, which is positive. It gives us some hope. But, and there's always another but, there is, or the findings in our report show that there is a, a lack of consensus as to you know, how do you persuade those parties who are not in favour of a Bill of Rights. The British government's position is that it is up to those parties in favour of a Bill of Rights, such as the SDLP, Sinn Féin, Alliance and the Green Party to persuade those who are not in favour of a Bill of Rights. Those parties feel that it's not their responsibility, it's not their political responsibility, it's the responsibility of the British government as a signatory to the Good Friday Stroke Belfast Agreement to pursue this issue, to give political leadership. So there's a stalemate. Nobody is taking political leadership on this particular issue, and that's why we have this political stalemate, this political vacuum. And in that context, what our report does is that it puts forward a number of recommendations as to how to address this political vacuum. And we talk about the possibility of creating a policy framework because, yes, there, and I mentioned earlier, there have been a number of agreements and declarations about a Northern Ireland Bill of Rights over the years, but our report argues that the Irish and British government's initiatives have lacked a policy framework to guide their interventions. So this is what our policy framework is advancing. It's a, a guided process where there would be clarification um, on the joint role of the two governments. Because again, one of the findings of the report shows that there is a divergence between the British government and the Irish government towards a Northern Ireland Bill of Rights. On the one hand, you have the Irish government who have explicitly expressed their disappointment that a Bill of Rights wasn't part of the Stormont House Agreement. Then, on the other hand, you have the British government with its current proposals, plans to repeal the Human Rights Act and introduce a British Bill of Rights. Some would say that that is a violation of the Good Friday Stroke Belfast Agreement. But it's interesting to note that the Secretary of State, um, and I'm going to quote her directly, I wouldn't want to misquote anybody, 
She was giving evidence before the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee in July 2015, and she highlights the importance of the Good Friday Agreement in advancing human rights legislation. She states, Michael, referring to Michael Gove, is very aware of the importance and the significance of the Belfast Agreement in determining our way forward on human rights legislation. So a Bill of Rights, part of human rights legislation. So it's a pity the British government won't follow through on that particular statement. The recommendations also talk about the location of um, what could be a roundtable discussion or a residential. Because as a follow-up from our report, we organised um, and hosted a roundtable discussion before um, Christmas of last year, and Alban very kindly participated in that roundtable discussion. And it was well attended both by the, there were representatives from the British and Irish government, um, from most of the political parties, civil society, academics, students, and the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission and policy makers. Um, and there were a wide range of views aired in that particular roundtable discussion. But the general consensus was that such a discussion was very helpful in terms of trying to reignite this debate about a Bill of Rights, which has been stagnant for the last number of years. But there was one issue in terms of um, the, the feedback from that particular um, session said, yes, it was very worthwhile, but there needed... Somebody mentioned that they should have closed the doors because some politicians came and said they're a piece and then they had to leave again. And that's totally understandable because we acknowledge and appreciate that our politicians are very busy people. But if we are going to be serious about progressing this Bill of Rights, the location of a roundtable discussion is, imp is an important factor to take into consideration um, so that we could have discussions uninterrupted uh, and from the publicity um, so we could have a serious discussion. Such uh, a guided process has to be, um, there needs to be technical and legal expertise as well, because one of the findings of our report showed that there is a misunderstanding among some of our politicians as to what a Bill of Rights can and can't deliver. And indeed, in one, I, um, I, I refer to the, the, the feedback from the um, Bill of Rights roundtable discussion, one politician did note that there needs to be training, there needs to be education around a Bill of Rights. And what would it mean to include, say, for example, social or economic rights in the Bill of Rights? Um, and that's very telling. So there needs to be technical and legal expertise guiding that particular process. And, of course... There has to be input from civil society. That has to happen in parallel to these political discussions. Because the civil society have been very vocal, have been very strong in terms of advocating a Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland. Um, so all of those factors have to be taken into consideration in trying to pursue, to progress this issue of a Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland. And as um, Alban referred to, the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission, whenever they submitted their advice in 2008, and when the NIO responded in 2009 in the form of a consultation document, there hasn't, d those documents haven't been discussed in an all-party political forum. And indeed, one of the representatives from the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission said that he would be more than willing to sit down with politicians 
and explain as to you know, what does it mean to have this particular right in, in a Bill of Rights. So that's what our recommendations are about. It's about providing this space, this opportunity to enable those discussions to take place. And that's very important because given the recent failure um, of the agreements such as the Stormont House Agreement, the Fresh Start Agreement, the Haas O'Sullivan Talks, and trying to make a Bill of Rights a part of those settlements. The Bill of Rights, for, um, in terms of the Haas O'Sullivan Talks, it was mentioned in passing in that it could be addressed in uh, the mechanism of the creation of the Commission for Culture and Identity. Stormont House Agreement, did mention the Bill of Rights under paragraph 69 towards the end of, I think it was in Annex V or Annex F, um, but there's no plan to take it forward. And likewise, the Fresh Start Agreement basically repeated what was in the Stormont House Agreement. So nothing, there's no political leadership on this issue, and that's what our report hopes um, to address um, and the, I just want to mention also the, um, whenever we started off our project there, there have been subsequent developments such as the Haas O'Sullivan Talks, the Stormont House Agreement and the Fresh Start Agreement and of course you, we have the current um, government's plans to repeal the Human Rights Act and introduce a British Bill of Rights. Nobody knows what's happening with that particular, um, with that particular issue, um, but the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission in its recent draft strategic plan did note that the Commission remains committed to seeing a Bill of Rights introduced in Northern Ireland, an issue which may be thrown into sharper relief once the UK government's plans for the replacement of the Human Rights Act with the British Bill of Rights becomes clear. So these discussions are now taking place in a different context that we imagined whenever we embarked on this particular project. And context is obviously very important when addressing such an issue. But given the failure of recent agreements to try to bring forward this particular issue. I think a solution to this particular problem in light of the British government's current plans makes it even more pertinent. And I hope that our report contributes to addressing that particular solution. So thank you.